All right, I'll begin again. Welcome, my name is Sonia Berthasau. I'm a PhD student at University of Maine and one of the coordinators for the USDA Northeast Climate Hub's GradCap program. GradCap is a virtual consortium of master's and doctoral students working on climate adaptation in agriculture, aquaculture, and forestry. Today's webinar on changing farm management will run about 40 minutes and will highlight the work of two GradCap scholars. We're very glad you've tuned in. Please note that this webinar is now being recorded for subsequent viewing. It's my pleasure today to introduce our speakers. Kyle Dittmer is a master's student in the Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources at University of Vermont and will present on soil management practices to mitigate carbon and nitrogen losses. And Joe Walls is a PhD student in the plant pathology program at Penn State University and will share his work on plant disease pressure and climate change. After both presentations, we'll have time at the end for a joint question and answer session. So you're encouraged to type questions in the box on your lower right throughout the presentation so we can refer back to these at the end to help guide the Q&A. All right, now I will turn the show over to Kyle Dittmer from UVM and please bear with me for just one moment while I pull up Kyle's presentation. Go ahead, Kyle. Roger. Good morning, everybody. For about the last year now, I have been researching the potential for a combination of different agricultural best management practices to mitigate gaseous carbon and nitrogen losses from agricultural soils. So when I say gaseous carbon and nitrogen, I'm predominantly speaking about greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide. We know that when these gases are in excess, they lead to alterations in the Earth's energy balance systems and are therefore major drivers of global climate change. These nutrient losses or gas, gaseous emissions also represent nutrient losses from these agricultural systems and therefore have negative impacts on farmers due to having them either have to increase input costs in the form of more frequent fertilization or a decrease in their revenue due to impeded crop yields. In the United States, the agricultural sector makes up about 10% of total greenhouse gas emissions. And then to go into agriculture itself, cropland soils are making up, or the dominant source of greenhouse gas emissions, making up about 30% of total greenhouse gas emissions. To break it down by each constituent gas, carbon dioxide is the third most dominant gas being emitted, with organic soils as the predominant source. Methane is the second dominant gas. However, it's not a significant source from upland soils, and therefore is not a major component of my research. Nitrous oxide is the largest gas, making up about 57% of all emissions from U.S. agriculture. And we can see from the pie chart on the left that how soil is being managed makes up about 78% of total nitrous oxide emissions. So there's a very tight linkage between soil management practices and nitrous oxide emissions. So before we get into different mitigation strategies, it's fairly important to talk about the different mechanisms that are driving these different gaseous losses. So starting with carbon dioxide, if oxygen is available in the system, then microbes will utilize an aerobic decomposition uh, process, which will yield carbon dioxide as the end product. So thinking about this in the framework of conventional farming practices, such as tillage or conventional tillage, if you're going to be tilling the soil, then that means that more oxygen will be entering the soil profile at much greater rates than would naturally ever be diffusing into these systems. And therefore, aerobic decomposition is expected to be increased. Also with tillage, you're going to be breaking up soil aggregates that may potentially be storing labile organic matter or easily decomposable organic matter. And so that is also expected to be increasing carbon dioxide emissions. If 
oxygen is not available in the system or if nitrate is just in high abundance, which oftentimes it typically will be in these systems since they're being fertilized. Microbes can utilize nitrate as a terminal electron acceptor following the denitrification pathway, which is the biological reduction of nitrate to molecular nitrogen. A primary requirement for denitrification to be complete, meaning that it will be fully reduced to molecular nitrogen, is that oxygen cannot be available in the system. Again, with upland agriculture, oxygen typically will be available, and therefore nitrous oxide will most likely or very likely be the terminal product of denitrification. Nitrous oxide can also be a byproduct during nitrification, during the oxidation of hydroxylamine to nitrite. So that's all just to demonstrate two different mechanisms for nitrous oxide emissions and one primary mechanism for carbon dioxide emissions. So the management practices in which I've been researching are different conservational tillage regimes or no tillage. I'm also looking at the time of the year in which manure is being applied. So that would just be fall versus spring manure application with the idea here of applying nutrients at the time of the year in which the crop nutrient demand is going to be the greatest. And I'm also looking at manure application methods. So it would be broadcast without incorporation or manure injection. Manure injection is a relatively new form of applying manure to the soil, and it's a pretty great mechanism um, or method for no-till systems since it minimally disturbs the soil surface. But it also is going to be putting nutrients directly into the rooting zone, and it also aims to reduce ammonia losses in the form of, or volat the volatilization of ammonia. Um, so ammonia is not a greenhouse gas, but it is recognized as an atmospheric pollutant and can cause eutrophication if it's redeposited in nitrogen-limited ecosystems, and therefore is a fairly important gas to be quantifying as well. I'm also looking at the potential for cover crops to improve the nitrogen use efficiency of these systems. So the idea here being that the cover crop is going to compete with microbes during the off-season for that residual inorganic nitrogen. The cover crop is going to store that nitrogen into its biomass, and then upon termination and decomposition of the cover crop, that organic form of nitrogen is going to be liberated back into the inorganic fraction, and therefore kind of act, be acting as a slow-release fertilizer in a sense. Cover crops are also going to be taking up atmospheric carbon dioxide, and so therefore they have the potential to mitigate both carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide emissions. fairly important to mention that these management practices have been well studied as individual entities. However, many of these management practices have been researched in the framework of improving crop yields or improving soil health. Um, the research that has been done that does look at gaseous emissions is still fairly variable at this time. Um, so I just want to point out two different studies here that looked at manure application method. So the study on the left shows that manure injection injection does significantly decrease ammonia losses relative to broadcast application. However, the study on the right found that manure injection significantly increases nitrous oxide emissions relative to broadcast. So some pretty big trade-offs alone with manure application method. And in respect with tillage, the results even at this time are very variable in the literature. So again, just want to point out two different studies looking at different tillage regimes on mitigating these gaseous losses. The study on the left shows that zero tillage decreased both carbon dioxide and methane emissions relative to tilled soils. However, it increased nitrous oxide emissions. The study on the right found that reduced tillage actually increased both carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide emissions. So in order to address this variability, I have two different field trials, both of which are located in Albert, Vermont, and both of which are continuous corn silage systems. The first field trial is the mint field trial, which is essentially isolating the effects of manure application method, so just broadcast versus manure injection. The time of the year in which manure is being applied, fall and spring, and also two different conservational tillage practices here being vertical tillage and no tillage. 
All of the plots within the mint field trial receive a winter rye cover crop, and therefore I have a second field trial, which is the care field trial, to isolate the effects of cover crops on mitigating these gaseous losses. So the treatments within the care field trial being presence or absence of cover crops, no-till and conventional tillage, so different tillage regimes here, and again, spring and fall manure applications. So the overall objectives of this research are first to find the combination of management practices that are expected to reduce the greatest amount of carbon and nitrogen losses. But we also don't want to be promoting different practices that are going to be negatively impacting crop yields or crop quality. So we're also observing corn yields and corn protein content. It would take a very long time to go through the um, reasonings behind all these expected results. But what we do expect to find is that a no-till system with manure injection during the spring, while also utilizing cover crops, will obtain the greatest amounts of nutrients or carbon and nitrogen in the soils, while either hopefully even benefiting crop yields or not negatively impacting crop yields or crop quality. In order to measure the greenhouse gases, I utilize static chamber-based method, which essentially is just a PVC soil collar installed in the soil all year round. And I put a fitted chamber lid over that collar where I can then take gas samples at regular timed intervals. And then I measure those gas samples on a um, gas chromatograph. I measure greenhouse gases about once a week, or I'm sorry, once every other week with more intensive sampling periods occurring after management events and specifically after manure application events. Ammonia cannot be measured via gas chromatography, so therefore I take a photoacoustic gas analyzer out into the field with me and have three different sampling points um, directly after manure application since it's fairly well understood that ammonia losses are greatest within the first 48 hours after spreading. So my time points are time zero, which is directly after manure application, um, and then 24 hours and 48 hours post manure spreading. Some preliminary results from the mint field trial shows that manure injection does in fact significantly increase nitrous oxide emissions relative to broadcast. However, what I wanna point out is the year of 2016, we see a much smaller pulse of nitrous oxide relative to the other years. And we also found that soil moisture was a significant covariate. So this may all be to say that um, manure should be getting applied at times, oh, I'm sorry, taking a step back. So 2016 was a very dry year. Um, so the nitrifying and denitrifying bacteria probably weren't quite as stimulated to undergo those different um, nitrogen transformations that we previously discussed. So that may be to say that manure should be getting applied at the times of the year in which the soils are dry or when it's not quite expected to rain as much. For carbon dioxide emissions, um, we found that no tillage does decrease carbon dioxide emissions relative to vertical tillage. However, for both carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide, we did not find any significant interactions between manure application method or tillage regime. For corn yields, there was pretty much no significant interactions or significant covariates. And the same kind of held true with corn protein content. Except for corn protein, we found that year and tillage by year had a significant effect, um, which would probably be um, easily understood since climate is going to be changing, or the weather, I should say, is going to be changing on a year-by-year -year basis. Um, so that's not necessarily a bad thing. That just means that our treatments are not negatively impacting corn yield or corn protein. So that, that could actually be viewed as a beneficial thing. So based, so based off of that preliminary work, we um, have some more questions now, which I think is kind of how all research goes about. But we want to get a better understanding of what is causing these different pulses directly after manure application events. Is it nitrification? Is it denitrification? Um, pretty much what are the players in the game here? So we're going to be taking a molecular approach here. So 
so for that study, we're going to be using the CARE field trial, which seems fairly counterintuitive since we saw the largest pulses from the mint field trial, specifically with the uh, manure injection treatment. However, just from talking to different farmers and talking to different service providers, they seem to be much more interested in understanding the benefits of cover crops um, to their agricultural systems. So we're kind of just trying to work with what they want. And so that's why we chose the care field trial, because if you remember, that's the trial that has the um, cover crop treatments. So essentially what we're going to be doing is we're going to be sampling plots beef one week before and one week after manure application. And we're going to be performing a viable qPCR analysis with extracted RNA to kind of try to quantify different target genes during that code for different enzymes during denitrification and nitrification. So basically, we're not going to be identifying any bacteria. We're just going to be seeing what genes are active during this time and how are they changing after manure application. And that data is also going to be paired with the greenhouse gas data. So overall, farmers that are expected to, um, or farmers that are able to adopt the different management practices that we find to retain the greatest amounts of nutrients within their soils are expected to be building on farm resiliency in the face of climate change, while also being front runners in climate change mitigation. And with that, I would just like to thank the following people. This research would not be possible without them. And I will gladly answer any questions after Joe goes. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. And our second presenter today is, of course, Joe Walsh from Penn State University. And please bear with me for just one moment while I call up Joe's presentation. Go ahead, Joe, as soon as that pops up on your screen. All right. Good morning, everybody. Can everyone, can, can you hear me pretty well? Is this good? Coming yeah. loud and clear. Okay, cool. All right. So, yes, good morning, everybody. And I'd like to talk to you all this morning about one of uh, my projects for my dissertation, and it's about plant defenses and vi to viruses under climate change. Oh, yeah, I can't use this. There we go. All right, so some research interests that I had leading to my research were I wanted to look at what the uh, specific impacts of abiotic factors uh, related to climate change are on plant defenses and on virus evolution. I'll be focusing more on plant defenses today. And then I wanted to see how my findings could be used to aid virus management with increasing temperatures and drought stress. I know these are to uh, two minor, or not minor, but uh, specific components of climate change, but these are the ones that I am uh, focusing on. So climate change, we are predicting to exacerbate plant disease. And in this case, I will be focusing on plant viral disease. And we expect to see in the future that there will be an increase in insect, insect vector population growth through uh, insect, increased insect generations per season due to warmer temperatures, uh, maybe uh, higher, higher humidity, more rain events possibly. It depends on the region. And then we'll also see an increase in geographic range of, of vectors. Uh, higher latitudes and higher elevations may become more conducive to, to harboring these insect vectors. And then we're likely to see earlier disease outbreaks due to warmer, probably wetter winters in some areas, and due to more, uh, more insect generations, warmer weather will allow more virus generations per season. Uh, so we'll see a higher virus evolution and emergence rate in many areas. And so I have down here at the bottom uh, a, let me see, well, uh, I'm not going to use the pointer right now, but uh, so we have the disease triangle in this picture down at the bottom. And the disease triangle is looking at the interactions of the host, pathogen, and environment. And all of these three things 
interact to cause disease in a host. And so right now we have these conditions in, in our various areas that show that we have a specific amount of area underneath the disease triangle that is conducive to a pathogen to cause disease. However, with climate change, we're likely to see some changes. Uh, we, we don't know for sure whether these changes are actually going to be conducive to increasing disease, for sure. So it could happen that here, this next uh, uh, part of the graph shows that it's possible that the change in environment could reduce disease pressure and that it reduces the conduciveness of, so I'm gonna pull up the pointer, Let's see if I can use this. So like this triangle shows that all of the uh, factors leading to disease may be less conducive to causing disease uh, for some reason, or it could happen that a couple of the factors such as environment and pathogen become more conducive to causing disease, but it may decrease the host susceptibility. So we have slightly less of an area underneath the disease in the disease triangle. But what we're more likely to see is that we're going to see an increase in area under the disease triangle. And you know it may be skewed in that the environment is is going to be going to be the biggest driver in in determining the amount of disease pressure in an area, or it could be that all the factors are going to increase at a similar rate and you know we still get this equilateral triangle, but there's a larger area and therefore more disease pressure. So the system that I chose to study this uh, is uh, tomato, tomato spotted wilt orthotospovirus, TSWV. And this virus is often listed as one of the top 10 most important plant viruses in the world. It infects over a thousand species of plants in 84 families. So it's, it's a generalist and infects many species. Um, and it is thrips transmitted. And there's a pointer. So here is the disease cycle of TSWV. You start out with a, an infected plant, which is fed on by first or second instar larvae, uh, thrips larvae. And then those larvae have to molt and pupate and then become an adult before they can transmit the virus to a new healthy host. And this is a persistent disease uh, transmission which means that once the thrips is, has, has acquired the virus, it can, uh, one, after it has molted, it can potentially uh, can, uh, transmit to a new host for the rest of its life. Um, so because of this, thrips are the traditional uh, focus of, of management and that is generally through insecticides. However, thrips are often very difficult to manage for a couple of reasons. They tend to hide in areas of the plant that are very, uh, they, they like both sides of their bodies to be touching something. So very like tight little areas which are difficult to get you know, insecticides into. And also they are parthenogenetic, which means they can, basically they can produce sexually and asexually. So if a uh, beneficial uh, phenotype arises, it can just explode in the population very quickly. So another uh, mechanism of disease, TSWV disease management is through host resistance. And there are two main genes that are uh, associated with resistance. The first is TSW, TSW in pepper, which conveys a very specific resistance to TSWV. And then there is the SW5 gene cluster, which conveys a more general resistance to orthotospoviruses in general. Um, however, we're seeing a lot of resistance breaking isolates. So in the future, we need to take into account the effect of, of climate and how it's allowing uh, resistance to be overcome by the virus. And so 
due to these reasons, or many of these reasons, exclusion and eradic eradication of the vectors and virus mm -hmm. is difficult, if not impossible, considering the generalist nature of them. And so what we're going to see with climate change and ortho orthotospovirus disease management is that we'll see a change in thrips phenologies. And if you look at this map on the bottom, this is not, this is not a map of, of thrips changes in, in uh, phenologies or generations per season. It's a uh, potato tuber moth, but we don't, we don't have a good map of how thrips generate uh, how thrips generations per season is going to change um, but we might see something similar to this where near the equator we're going to get a lot more generations of insect pests per season <coughs> and moving towards the poles we'll see a little a little less uh, increase in generations per season and you know this is this model is up for debate of course um, but so Either way, we're going to see an increase of insect generations per season, whether it be like this map shows or, or some other way. And therefore, more generations leads, means that we're going to see an increase in insecticide resistance in the thrips. And also, we'll see uh, genetic resistance becoming increasingly used, but we're also seeing that the <laughs> genes, the TSW and the SW gene cluster are losing their efficacy rather quickly. In California, it's already been reported that there are uh, resistance breaking isolates for both of these, uh, I think mainly the TSW gene in many places. And that may be because it's a warmer, drier climate. So, yeah, so leading up to my research, uh, I, I did some, some preliminary research on how differences in climate and mostly focused on drought stress can affect uh, disease pressure. And we know that plant defenses are differentially regulated under varying environmental conditions, be it drought stress, temperature, CO2 availability, uh, you know, any, anything of that nature. And uh, there are specific papers showing that drought stress can increase pathogen resistance and also virus infection can increase drought tolerance. So knowing these things, I wanted to look at plants, uh, how uh, plant susceptibility to TSWV under drought stress and well-watered conditions, as well as I, I'm, going to, I, I'm going to be looking at temperature change. Uh, how they can be explained by phyto, phytohormone regulation. So phytohormones are very important um, regulators of plant defenses. There's a multitude of them. I'm just showing three here uh, because these are the three pathways that I'm focused on. The jasmonic or the salicylic acid pathway I, is uh, responsible for uh, it, it is elicited during TSWV infection. Well, hold on for and just a been... second, Joe. There was a bit of uh, crunchy background noise in the background. So just a reminder, if you're listening into this call, feel free to put yourselves on mute um, if you're not Joe talking so that uh, we minimize background noise for everyone. Thanks. All right. So yes, the salicylic acid pathway is elicited during TSWV infection. Um, it it's generally responsible for biotroph such as virus or some bacterial pathogen defense. And then the jasmonic acid pathway is responsible for defending against herbivores such as insects and necrotrophs such as fungi that, that need to fill sections of the plants in order to uh, uh, receive nutrients from it. And then the abscisic acid pathway has traditionally been looked at in response to drought and salt stress. And an important thing to note from these, from this figure is that the jasmonic acid and salicylic acid pathways are antagonistic of each other in, in it, it is uh, host specific, 
uh, these, this graph, or this figure is from uh, uh, Arabidopsis, which mm. it changes from plant to plant, but generally it's accepted that if jasmonic mm -hmm. acid pathway signaling goes up, salicylic acid goes down and vice versa. And then abscisic acid inhibits the salicylic acid pathway while uh, being synergistic with the jasmonic acid pathway. So I did some screening of several mm -hmm. genes in all these pathways. The, the blue graphs, the PP2C2, are, is a, the PP2C2 is a negative regulator of the abscisic acid pathway, and the PPOF is a gene in the uh, a, a jasmonic acid pathway. So they are color-coded by their uh, pathway that they are in. Um, so what's interesting here is that I found that this first mm -hmm. row of graphs, the PP2C2 and the PPOF, this is when uh, the plants ultimately become infected. And this is four hours post-inoculation that these uh, gene expressions through, this is QP, quantitative real-time PCR, so these are <laughs> gene expression levels. Um, and so uh, they, they uh, this first row shows plants that are ultimately becoming infected with TSWV, and there is no difference between the TSWV and mock inoculations in plants that ultimately become infected. However, four hours post-inoculation, the second row in plants that fight off the infection that don't become infected, the PP2C2 is the upregulation of this gene is inhibited, while the PPOF in the jasmonic acid pathway is upregulated. So that's a little bit confusing, but I made a little uh, mm -hmm. uh, model here. And so compared to the control group, the mock, the, pull up the arrow, in the mock, the PP2C2 abscisic acid is upregulated compared to the control, and the jasmonic acid is also upregulated. However, in these plants that do not become infected ultimately, uh, we see that the PP2C2 is regulation is equal to that of the control, while the PPOF is uh, uh, more up, like more upregulated than the mock. Um, and then in plants that ultimately become infected with TSOV two weeks later, we see that it, it's the same thing as the mock. Um, so, so both the PP2C2 and PPOF are upregulated. So what's interesting about this is that we see that these pathways are very rapidly helping to induce resistance to the virus. So what I proposed for a, my Northeast SARE project, uh, I wanted to look at whether we can use these phytohormones as a management strategy targeted at uh, increasing plant resistance to specifically TSWV, but maybe this can be uh, uh, a more general defense effect. Um, and then I wanted to look at how temperature and drought stress may affect these strategies if they are viable. So what I'm doing for my Northeast SARE is I'm taking tomato cultivar better boy and treating them with drought stress and a well-watered uh, group. And in each of these groups, I have a control where there's no exogenous phytohormone application. And then I will have three uh, other treatments of jasmonic acid, salicylic acid, and abscisic acid application. And so eight, basically, I will have eight treatments per temperature at 20, 25, and 30 Celsius. And the, so what I'll do is I will inoculate uh, these tomato plants at the beginning of their true leaf development, approximately at the stage you see in the picture down at the bottom. And uh, then I will apply the phytohormones, jasmonic, salicylic, and abscisic acid, both two days in, before and two days after inoculation. And um, we will see, the, uh, so what that will do is it will cause a continue, continuous upregulation of these pathways during infection, inoculation with the virus. And then after two weeks, we will record infection rate and severity to see if 
the phytohormone application might actually increase uh, resistance or tolerance to the virus. So the importance of, of these findings are that the abscisic acid pathway was very recently recognized to have a direct role in virus resistance uh, through the uh, uh, gene silencing pathway. The abscisic acid uh, controls the argonaut proteins, which are responsible for a uh, uh, component of the gene silencing pathway. And so the work that I've found thus far is consistent with these findings with the role of the abscisic acid in virus resistance, as well as the jasmonic acid pathway seems to have a little bit of a, an impact on it as well, which is very interesting considering the salicylic acid pathway is the one traditionally seen in uh, being upregulated during virus infection. And this defense response is mounted very rapidly as soon as four hours post inoculation and so I'm thinking the abscisic acid pathway could serve as a target for uh, TSWV resistance in the future, or possibly even the jasmonic acid pathway. Some uh, preliminary uh, experiments that I've done show that uh, when I inoculate uh, 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 jasmonic acid deficient mutants with TSWV, the ones that I use a, an exogenous jasmonic acid application uh, show that fewer plants tend to become infected. So adding jasmonic acid seems to increase uh, the, the plant's resistance to TSWV, which is very interesting. And so bringing, bringing it back to my hypothesis, plant susceptibility to TSWV under drought stress and low watered conditions can be explained by phytohormone regulation. Um, we're going to see that many regions will experience increased drought and temperature stress. Um, and we know from the literature that drought alters plant defenses and there is a very intimate uh, mm -hmm. uh, crosstalk between all these defense phytohormone pathways such as jasmonic acid, salicylic acid, and abscisic acid. And also, uh, virus infection does alter the expression of abscisic acid regulators, as PP2C2 is a negative regulator of the abscisic acid pathway. And so, we in in literature previously, uh, we've we've seen that abscisic acid is often considered to be a negative regulator of disease resistance in general. But here, I'm I'm seeing that uh, soon after inoculation, the expression of abscisic acid and jasmonic acid pathways may be positive regulators of disease res of virus resistance. And, and we know that abscisic acid responds to temperature stress as well. So I believe in my Northeast SARE yeah. uh, project, I will see some variation at these different temperatures. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge my lab um, who have helped me immensely and the Penn State College of Agricultural Sciences, uh, Department of Plant Pathology and Environmental Microbiology, and then my funding sources, uh, USDA NEFA and Northeast SARE. And of course, I'd like to thank GradCap for giving me this uh, opportunity to present some of my research to you guys. And with that, I'll take any questions. Awesome, thank you so much, Joe. Um, yeah. And uh, please continue typing questions uh, in our question box on the right here uh, as they occur to you. I want to remind folks before we begin the question and answer that um, the final webinar in this series on stakeholder beliefs and actions will broadcast live on December 7th starting at noon. So I do hope you'll join us for that. Um, you can find details for this upcoming webinar and uh, recordings to some of our past webinars at the link at the bottom of this screen. All right, I see more questions are coming in, which is wonderful. Let's start off with a question for you, Kyle. Um, Ivan asks, are there any management strategies for reducing um, N2O focused on increasing C to N ratio in soil to enhance immobilization? Um, yeah, kind of indirectly. So that's kind of getting at the no-tillage practice. I mean, that's kind of tying together the no-tillage with cover crops. 
So pretty much to build the carbon and nitrogen in the soils, it pretty much relies on what is going into the soil. So what is the carbon and nitrogen ratio of the crop residue? So for corn, that has a pretty high carbon and nitrogen ratio, so it's a little bit harder to be decomposing. But by adding the cover crop in, which has a lower carbon and nitrogen ratio, so a little bit easier to decompose, you're kind of um, stimulating denitrifying, or not denitrifying, I'm sorry, just stimulating all bacteria to be decomposing that, um, that winter rye cover crop or whatever cover crop that might be by adding a greater source of nitrogen. Um, which in turn can potentially allow them to go back and um, decompose that or the um, the corn residue. So it, it really comes down to um, kind of trying to pair a ideal carbon to nitrogen ratio that will be ideal for um, microbial decomposition, which they like a carbon to nitrogen ratio around 30 to 1. Um, yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Next up, a question for Joe. Why might climate change be expected to result in more rapid viral evolution? Yeah, so this is, this is kind of a, part of it's a hypothesis of mine. Part of it is, you know, based on what we see in the literature. Um, so, so an increase in temperature is, A, going to mean that the insect vectors are going to be uh, uh, growing faster because insects are very dependent upon uh, temperature and humidity and other various things for for growth. So if an insect vector is is growing faster, it's it's likely that virus replication in the insect will also be faster. Same with the plant. Um, we're likely to see that uh, plant metabolism is is probably going to increase as well. Um, so that means that if if there's more <laughs> virus, more likely that there's going to be a uh, uh, like mutation that becomes beneficial, and also there's probably there there's going to be variation in uh, uh, probably UV exposure, uh, which might have an effect on it. So basically, there's there's going to be a change in in uh, pressure in selection pressure for the viruses with climate change, which, which makes sense, right? Because there's, there's going to be, uh, since there's going to be a variation in, in climate, it's, it's going to have to adapt to that new climate. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Kyle, a question for you next. Kara asks, um, are there common practices used by farmers now that you think your research uh, would sort of change, or do you see this research as helping to manage the timing of practices that farmers are already predominantly using? Um, yeah, I mean, I hope that some of these venture practices will be adopted. Um, I mean, farmers are very willing to change their farming practices. They are just pretty much wanting to see the data that if they change their practices, they are going to be expected to um, you know, provide the same yield while also being environmental stewards. Um, so, so um, yeah, I'm not sure that anything will be disrupted. Um, I feel like that's kind of like a negative term. I don't want to um, kind of be telling them to adopt practices that will negatively impact any of their farming practices. But, um, yeah, I think that everything should be fairly beneficial. Cool, thanks. Uh, Joe, next up, two related questions for you. One is, um, where did you get the phytohormones and how did you apply them that you used in your research? And then uh, Mike Allen asked as a follow-up, are, are there any thoughts about if these might be made into commercial products to enhance resistance? Right. Yeah. So, uh, yes. So I, I get my uh, phytohormones from like Sigma Aldrich, uh, pretty much any chemical company is going to have them. They're, they're very, they're used for lots of different things. Actually, uh, you can find salicylic acid in like wart removers, for example. Um, and it's, it's like they're, they're used, but I don't think we fully understand their effects, especially on, on the plants. Um, it's it's a fairly new field um, within the past 
20 years, I'd say we've really started focusing on it a lot more. Um, but mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah, so you can get them from chemical companies and they're extremely concentrated. So you just, I uh, forget how much I use. It's like, it's like a, a milliliter in, in like a liter or something like that. And so like mm -hmm. very diluted. And then I just take a spray bottle and spray them on the plants. Uh, and it, it, it up, the plants just uptake it, I believe, through their stomata. And uh, we'll, since there's an increase in that uh, vital hormone, it will upregulate that pathway. Wow. And to answer Michael's question, uh, so a lot of these are already used in agriculture, uh, salicylic acid, and uh, I believe I've seen sal salicylic acid, and I believe I've seen jasmonic acid. Uh, in some products, but the thing is with these products is it's they're not just used for the phyto hormones. Usually they're so they're like they're called biostimulants, and they kind of just throw in like phyto hormones and other plant nutrients as kind of just like a cocktail of this will make your plant grow better. But I we don't really know the specific effects of of each of the components usually. Um, so yeah, you can, you can go out and you can buy, uh, I can't remember the names of the products, but you can, you can look up like biostimulants, uh, salicylic acid, uh, you know, things like that. And you can actually find products with these already in them. Neat. Cool. Thanks yeah. for telling us about that. Um, yep. next up, a question for you, Kyle, are there any regulations governing nitrogen losses from agricultural management that you know of? Um, off the top of my head, the first, if by regulations, you mean maybe like laws or just, um, kind of legislation. Oh, I, I know that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so in Vermont, at least there are regulations to where you can't be applying manure after October until I believe March or, um, April maybe. Um, so that's just kind of to reduce any runoff that could be going into waterways. And it's also extremely encouraged for farmers that are um, close to waterways or just water bodies to build buffer zones. So basically just by creating ditches that may lead into maybe a wetland or um, a retention pond or something like that with some sort of vegetation that could potentially polish off any nutrients that are entering into those ways, waterways. Um, and it's also recommended for them to get their groundwater tested if they are um, close to that, but other than that, I'm not exactly sure of what regulations there would be, um, other than mainly the timing of the year for manure application or fertilization. Thank you. Um, a question for Joe next. Does wet weather also make plants more susceptible to viruses? Right. So, I don't, I wouldn't say necessarily that it makes them more susceptible so much as much, you know, much wetter uh, conditions make the plants uh, just, just more unhealthy, which I, I don't know if you can say that that is the direct, like the reason that uh, they're more susceptible so much as maybe the plant is more unhealthy. The, the insects may be doing, the vectors may be doing better in in wetter conditions rather than dry uh increasing their uh, uh reproduction rate and and everything um i don't know i don't know if anybody's really looked at uh the impact of excess water on uh, uh virus susceptibility most of it's very focused on droughts so, yeah. all right thanks um we're going to bop back to a question for Kyle. Is there a way for you to measure nitrogen losses from the different plots or an index of potential nitrogen losses to assess the effects of mm -hmm. different management practices? Uh, or maybe you've read some literature on this. Um, detailed question. So, <laughs> yeah, that is very detailed. Mm -hmm. um, so oh, okay. by each plot, I'm not sure if you remember my experimental design, but I do have about four different replicates per each treatment. Um, so we can kind of get a, um, a visual of how 
the magnitude of these different nitrous oxide pulses are occurring within each plot. Um, and then we could just perform some fairly simple calculations to get the magnitude between those differences. Um, I'm not exactly sure of any index potentials of nitrogen loss other than the nitrogen use efficiency, which is a fairly simple calculation of just pretty much um, looking at how much manure was applied versus how much is left in the soil and also how much was taken up by the crops. Um, so that's perhaps one index. Um, that's, that's the predominant one that I've seen amongst the literature, though, that I'll also be utilizing. Great, thanks. Uh, Joe, next to you. Are the responses to temperature and drought stress um, likely continuous or threshold responses? Right. So I, I believe that it's uh, a little bit of both. Um, so if we're looking at, uh, for example, like enzymatic activity, so there's, there's, a, there's like a critical threshold, right? It's required for uh, uh, activation and uh then that that threshold drops like the, the activity of the enzyme drops off very quickly at a certain temperature so there are mm -hmm. i think you know temperatures there that some are more conducive to to uh enzymatic activity you know like replication and and uh and transcription translation things like that of that nature um also if we look at the the insect vector we see that the starting at like 15 to 20 Celsius, mm -hmm. I'd say there's a steady increase of growth oh, yeah. of the insect, but then at like 30 to 35, it depends on the insect, of course, 30 to 35, uh, it drops off very quickly and mm -hmm. certain they, you know, the temperature just kills them. So yeah, I think it's, I think it's a, it's, you know, it's kind of a gradual graph. Mm -hmm some jumps in it, basically. Hey, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. All right, it looks like a final question that I see in front of me right now is for Kyle. Uh, what factored into your choice of cover crop in your experiments, and do you think different species of cover crop might yield different results? So I actually did not have any input as to which cover crop we used. Um, so my field trials were actually pre-established um, prior to me even arriving at UVM. Um, so the MIN trial has been going on since 2013 um, and the care field trial since 2016. Um, and also these field trials were being utilized primarily to look at these management practices as affecting corn yield and corn protein. And we just kind of, or I should say my advisor and her previous graduate student saw a good opportunity to be quantifying greenhouse gas emissions from these different management practices. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why they chose the winter rye cover crop. It's just a very inexpensive mm -hmm. yeah. cover crop to be utilizing with a fairly low carbon and nitrogen ratio. Mm -hmm. um, so it could be adding a high quality organic matter back to the soil. But if I could do this myself, and I, if I had the option, I would really enjoy to do this with maybe a nitrogen fixing crop, such as um, legumes. I think that that would be a very interesting component to add to this project. It's on Thursday. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you both. Um, we've taken almost a full hour, so excellent questions for our presenters today. Um, really interesting presentations. Kyle Dittmer, Joe Walls, thank you both so much, and thanks everyone yeah, else who tuned in. Thank you.